Good afternoon, members, and to those watching online and in the chamber, welcome to uh, this meeting of Perth and Kinross Council. Um, I will uh, outline again what I've advised earlier in terms of there will be a lunch break if necessary uh, after the planning application, depending on how we are doing time wise. Um, I'm thinking it's probably looking very likely at this point. So, um, uh, and that will be an hour's lunch break to ensure staff can also have a break uh, properly as well. Um, the uh, clerk will now confirm apologies and take a roll call of those who are joining virtually online. Uh, uh, morning, members. Just say we have no apologies um, this afternoon. So I will just uh, run through who's present in the chamber and if those online can confirm they're present. So we have Bailey Ahern in the chamber, um, Councillor Allen, Councillor Anderson, Gilly Bailey. Councillor Lewis Barrett. Councillor Lewis Barrett. Sorry, sorry. Um, can everyone check who is in the room? They are not to join the meeting. Getting a significant issue. I'm here, 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 here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one councillor of Peter Barrett is quite enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Councillor Braun in the chamber. Uh, Bailey Brock. Present. We have Councillor Carr in the chamber. Councillor Chan. Present. In the chamber we have Councillor Cuthbert, Councillor Donaldson, Councillor Drysdale, Councillor Duff, Councillor Forbes, Councillor Frampton, Councillor Freshwater, Councillor Harvey, Councillor Illingworth, Councillor James, Councillor Kigali, Councillor Lane, Councillor Leishman, Councillor McPherson, Councillor Massey, Councillor McCall. Present. Thank you. Uh, Provis McDade in the chamber, Councillor McEwen, Bailey McLaren, Deputy Provis Parrott, Councillor Rebeck. Present. Thank you. Um, Councillor Reid. Present. Thank you. Councillor Robertson. Present. Thank you. In the chamber, Councillor Shires, Councillor Smith, Councillor Colin Stewart. Yes. Thank you. In the chambers, Councillor Grant Stewart, Councillor Waters, Councillor Welch, and Bailey Williamson. Present. Thank you. All members are present, Provost. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to ask if members have any declarations of interest in respective items on today's agenda. Councillor Angus Forbes. Thank you, Provost. I've returned to the chamber to give exactly the same declaration of interest I gave earlier on, and I'll now leave the chamber. Um, sorry, just for the men, people watching online who weren't in the predetermination committee, can you outline that, please? Thank you. Morris Leslie Group are one of my customers. Thank you very much. Uh, Bailey Ahern. Yeah, I also have a non-financial interest in item six. Thank you very much. Um, I am John, Councillor John Duff, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost. Again, just for the sake of transparency, I wanted to make it clear that the Perth and Kinross Conservative and Unions Association are tenants of Morris Leslie in relation to our premises at the control tower at Perth Airport. Uh, in considering the objective test as set out in the Code of Conduct, However, I don't think I think this is too remote to constitute a declarable interest for uh, Conservative councillors, but I just wanted to make that uh, connection clear. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Councillor Duff. Um, I'm seeing no other declarations of interest and therefore we'll move on to item three, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, can we agree the minutes of the meeting of the Council on the 22nd of June 2022? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Um, under matters arising, uh, item five, the integration scheme, um, I would like to just get the council's um, agreement to, it was mentioned at the council meeting, but it was not formally part of the motion that the chief executive is empowered uh, to make small technical changes to the final version that have been brought back by 
the Scottish Government. Um, it does not change any of the substantive points of it. It is small technical changes um, and they've already been made by Dundee City Council and Angus Council on NHS Tayside. So we are just seeking uh, to confirm what was mentioned but was not in the motion. Are members in agreement with that? Agreed. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask Council um, that under uh, Standing Order 11.1 .1, that we agree to vary the order of business and um, to consider item 6 at this point. Are members agreed? Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Bailey Ahern. Okay, thank you very much, members. Um, I'm going to remind all members that uh, you required to have attended the predetermination committee and um, to take part in this item. So anyone who is not present for that item must now leave the meeting. Um, and uh, you heard um, the representations earlier. This will be an opportunity for you to ask questions for officers. Um, and uh, I'm going to invite Christian Smith to provide an introduction to the report. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Provost, and good afternoon, councillors and others in attendance. Uh, as briefly as possible, and following on from the earlier, more detailed presentation at the predetermination hearing, I will summarise the application and some of the issues. Overall, planning permission in principle is sought for a mixed use development comprising a transport museum with ancillary shop and cafe, a hotel and holly lodge accommodation, complementary retail generally to be contained within the museum building and associated infrastructure, including vehicle access points, parking, public realm access, open space and landscaping works. It is also proposed to provide an area where PKC could develop a park and choose facility. However, all matters relating to design layout, phasing of the proposal and so forth will be matters for further consideration when the approval of matters specified in conditions applications or reserve matter applications come forward. I also noted comments in the deputations at the predetermination hearing and can advise that it's proposed to provide a footway along the frontage of the site and turn to link into a further footpath to be provided along the frontage of the adjoining Ogilvy site, which is specified uh, the, the requirement in this case of this application specified in conditions 29 to 33. However, the imposition of such a requirement to see this expanded uh, to the far eastern end of the holdings would not, in officer's view, be a reasonable condition to be placed upon this application. Uh, hence, also the comments that there had been no discussions on this issue actually relates to discussions associated to the planning application. However, it is a matter which the Executive Director for Communities has advised that the Councillors Roads Authority will investigate and I also understand that the applicant are willing to work with the Council on that. I also noted the theme of the limitation on extent of retail, uh, that which is controlled by a recommended condition to limiting retail to 750 square metres and no unit larger than 200 metres squared. In addition to the application itself, circulation has been issued giving some clarity on the position related to the land associated to the park and choose facility I mentioned, uh, that being identified in LDP2 and has planning permission and is to be delivered by Perth and Ross Council. That land of planning permission is granted to see ownership transferred to Perth and Ross Council obligated by a section 75 legal agreement. A separate circulation was also issued in relating to a paragraph associated with the trunk road. Uh, now myself and various other officers in attendance are happy to answer any questions. These include in relation to economic development matters, transport matters, uh, planning policy, uh, the planning processing of the application, legal matters and the Executive Director for Communities is also available. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Mr Smith. Um, do members have questions for officers? Councillor Colin Stewart. Thank you, Provost. I think I probably have a number, but I'll just ask them one at a time and let other people come in in between. Uh, but my first question is uh, in relation to paragraph four of the report before us. 
regarding the park and ride, park and choose, which already has planning permission, that is uh, reference 1802232FLM. Can I ask what the size of that exists, how many parking spaces are provided for in that existing planning permission, um, given that the proposed um, one is uh, approximately 100? Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Uh, I, I have to apologise, I don't have that figure in front of me, uh, but the matter in relation to the park and choose facility would be negotiated between the council and the applicant landowner relative to the area to be set aside, uh, and that would have to include for whatever the council felt was an appropriate scale to be undertaken. OK, well, just as a quick supplementary then, uh, just looking at the um, indicative map versus the um, what's provided for in the local development plan and the planning application, it looks like the proposed site is um, approximately a third of the size of um, uh, what's set aside in the LDP and the um, granted planning permission. I was wondering, therefore, have uh, officers given consideration to what a critical mass for such a park and choose facility would be. Is 100 enough or is the 300 that is provided for in LDP and planning permission um, what is required for a critical critical mass for a park and ride? Thank you for that. I, I'll defer that matter to uh, my transport colleagues that can advise on discussions and uh, considerations relative to the park and choose. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, it's Lachlan McLean here. Um, I'll endeavour to answer your question, um, Councillor Stewart. Um, with regards um, to the, the previous park and ride application that we had, um, yes, you're correct. It was um, substantially more spaces. It was 240 spaces um, that we had um, within our planning consent um, for the site. Um, in discussion um, with the applicant, um, they had advised that there was 100 spaces available um, with the layout that they have before us just now, um, it may be possible through discussion that we might be able to um, acquire um, more spaces um, for the site. I suppose one thing to, to probably note is that um, in terms of critical mass, as you were um, mentioning, um, our original scheme was solely for a park and ride site, so probably to make it operationally um, efficient, um, we would need to have the 240 spaces. But if we were, dare I say, using the word piggyback on the, the back of the site and the offering that may be on site in terms of the museum and um, the, the hotel, it may be more commercially viable um, for us to have a smaller park and ride um, and run a service to and from the site. OK, thanks. OK, uh, Deputy Provost, please. Thank you, Provost. Can I confirm that I'm correct in my understanding that if approved today, um, the transfer of land for the park and choose site must take place before the um, planning permission in principle is, is formally granted? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yet the intention is that there would be a Section 75 legal agreement that would set out an obligation for the transfer of the land and ownership to Perth and Kinross Council. And and if I may, and, and that is before the, the, the PPIP is formally granted to the applicant. Yes, the, the planning permission in principle would not be issued until such time as the legal agreement was concluded. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Thanks, Provost. I've got three questions, so you might want me to split them. It's, it's up to no, you. I'm quite happy for you to take them all at the okay, same time. Fine. Thank okay. you. So the first question um, relates to pedestrian safety. We've heard a lot about that this morning. Um, so my question firstly is, are we able to condition either for the work to be done directly or for developer contribution? for the installation of this pedestrian pathway, which we've heard about, or for the road to be blocked by the gateway, uh, for um, probably for emergency vehicles and um, uh, um, uh, repair traffic, or for speed restrictions on this road in the interest of vehicle safety. I think I, I, I caught you there, Councillor Braun. Thanks for your question. And I think what you were asking, because I couldn't quite hear you 
clearly it was a bit uh, glitchy. Are you meaning could we apply a condition which requires an upgrade to the footway all the way to the east of the holdings? Yes, I'm asking, if, is, is that possible or is it possible for a condition on speed calming measures along this road or for the road to be closed at one end, as was mentioned by the objectors, uh, either by uh, the uh, the applicant doing it themselves or by a developer contribution? Yeah, I, I think I covered that in my introduction there that uh, our, our view as officers would be that would not be a reasonable or competent condition. However, uh, as I indicated as well, uh, is open to the Council as Roads Authority to look at those issues uh, and the Executive Director for Communities is committed uh, that that will be looked at and I also understand that the applicant is comfortable with working with uh, the Council on that matter to see what they can do to assist. Thank you for that. I'm sorry, but I couldn't hear you very well because like myself, you, you move away from the microphone. My second point was um, to do with the, the retail side. Um, obviously, there's a restaurant and cafe in the in the development side, which will attract people in. Um, is this going to? Uh, I know we've made a slight calculation of, of what the effect on the city centre is going to be, but obviously, if you go to a cafe or a restaurant in in Perth, you've got to park, pay to park, walk to the restaurant and cafe. Uh, here, you would just go and park probably without a fee and go to the cafe or restaurant. Has that been calculated in the effect that might have on city centre cafes and restaurants? I'd maybe defer the detail to my economic development colleagues that will have looked at this matter, but in terms of you know how we would look at impacts on city centres, we have considered that carefully and a number of the details are set out in the various reports, but perhaps and uh, my colleagues in relation to economic development could give you a bit more detail. Alan Graham, I believe, is in attendance. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. I think the um, as made out in the background paper, the um, the worst case scenario was a proposed estimated turnover was derived from city Perth city centre was very much a worst case scenario and would equate an impact of 1.6% on the centre. Some of that would be food and beverage related, but that was very much a worst case scenario. And obviously there's been uh, conditions proposed relative to the size of the retail and the food and beverage element. Thank you for that. Uh, the last question is, is, is a concern that I have. Um, there was an application on an adjoining site to the east of uh, this development, and I appreciate there's no precedent in planning. Uh, this um, this site was rejected by uh, officers, I believe, on delegated authority, um, uh, primarily because the land was open space. That subsequently came to the LRB in June, um, and it, again it was rejected unanimously by the three uh, members of the of the panel. Uh, primary primary again because of the land being open space. So my question really is fundamentally, if we take everything out of the equation, this land is open space. And are we, I'm not going to set a precedent, but are we effectively saying to people that open space can now be used um, for building? Um, as an ideal example, the land that was uh, put to the LRB, which is immediately adjacent, could somebody else now come back and say, can we build on it? Because you know, I know there's no effectively no precedent, but there's obviously the example that the land next to it has now been overruled as open space. People in the area consider this open space in our LDP. Are we ourselves opening ourselves up, I suppose, and opening a door to other um, open space development? This may be a question perhaps for legal rather than yourself, Mr. Smith. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe quickly respond first and, and Mr Fogg can add if necessary. What, what I'd maybe say in, in relation to those two cases, I think I know the one that you're, you're referring to, which was a residential proposal on the semicircular area uh, and the holdings uh, and as set out in the reports and handling, 
post in relation to the, the decision by officers and the LRB. It was quite clear how the planning balances have been considered in relation to that and why that was not considered acceptable. Uh, and as you'll see before you today in terms of the, the report on handling, that's a paper before you. Uh, in this case, the planning considerations uh, have been balanced and in this instance, uh, officers feel that uh, the departure from the development plan is appropriate. As you indicated yourself, you know, you should not overly compare one application with another. Uh, and in terms of precedent, you know, it's a very wide ranging matter uh, for consideration. You need to look at each uh, application on its merits and the merits of those two applications saw the two recommendations and in one case decision taken. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Waters. Please. Oh. Mr. Fogg's going to provide additional. Yeah, uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Smith has already said most of what I would otherwise have said in answer to your response. Uh, as he says, each application is looked at in its own merits, and the merit planning merits of this are substantially different considerations to the other application uh, in the locality to which you referred. Another factor, of course, is this is uh, land largely that was zoned in the development plan as employment land, which is not a factor in the uh, other application to which you referred. So again, they're very, very different um, sets of circumstances and one would be unwise to try and draw too many parallels between those two unrelated applications. OK, thank you. Content. I was just say thank you both for the, for the clarification on that. Thank you. Councillor Waters, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Provost. Uh, ju just on active travel, given given this applications out, outside the LDP and, and where I, I fully know the, the the comments that were made in the deputations from from the, the, the applicant over over area that's in their control and upgrade the active travel routes. But but an important part of any development that we we approve should should have should have a, a good good active travel connections with with I would say uh, Perth 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 City without without a doubt. And um, what what is the what is the uh, active travel routes from that area into Perth and what what um, standard are they at? Admitted. You know, just first of all, say that this is an application for planning permission in principle, and there are a number of conditions recommended before you today. Condition 21, I understand uh, from memory, requires an active travel plan that would look into that matter in detail. Uh, but in terms of the, the current situation, if you, you want guidance on that, I'd maybe again defer to uh, Lachlan McLean, my transportation colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, um, and thank you for your question, um, Councillor Waters. Um, in terms of um, routes um, in the surrounding area, there are a number of core paths, um, some which travel through, traverse through the site. Um, we've also got the core path um, that goes down um, past um, uh, Willowgate um, down on the riverside um, and meanders um, through some of the trees um, down towards um, Perth City Centre. Um, from my experience, the path is no more than a trodden path, um, if I'm quite honest, in terms of core path. Um, in terms of existing um, footway network um, going along the side of the A85, um, there's a shared use section um, from the development site um, just before you come into the um, Dundee Road there. Um, and then thereafter, it is a pedestrian um, footway um, continuing into Perth City Centre along the Dundee Road. And any cyclists um, would have to merge with the existing traffic um, on the 85. I think uh, Mr Littlejohn also wishes to make a comment. OK, Mr Littlejohn. Thank you very much, Provost. It was just a, a kind of supplementary point to, to, to Lachlan McLean. Um, it, it is the Council's intention when funding becomes available um, through the Perth People Place strategy which members will will recall the council um, approved uh, a year or so ago that that riverside path from Willowgate to the cent city centre will be upgraded to, to, to full cycleway as and when um, uh, funds become available. And that's a matter that we're in discussion with with Sustrans on, again, not in the control of this applicant, 
but in terms of that wider kind of strategic cycle network, um, that is very much um, front and central in our thinking of how to improve that uh, active travel connection with Willowgate and indeed uh, should it be approved the, this particular development. Thank you, that's that's appreciated and, and definitely would have to be a key part of any development here to get that upgrade and brought up to a suitable standard to actually give a, a meaningful a meaningful incentive for people to uh, use other forms of transport rather than the car. Sorry, is there a question in there, Councillor Walsh, or just a comment? Just a comment. Okay, Councillor Harvey. Uh, right, thank you, Provost. Um, that's a very interesting uh, comment you've made there. I just want to clarify an issue to do with the car parking spaces. There's a hundred for the parking rides or parking share park, whatever it's called, uh, and 240 for the hotel. Uh, are you think it is that a combined 340 then, or is it? And would the hotel parking be allowed to be used for the park and ride scheme? And there wouldn't be you would there be any requirement for people to pay for parking or restricted parking or that type of thing. If you could just clarify that for me. Maybe firstly in relation to and thank you, Councillor Harvey, for your question. Uh, in relation to the the commercial arrangement, uh, that's not a planning matter necessarily, so I can't really comment on that. Uh, beyond that, and I think uh, my colleague Mr McLean had indicated that you know we would hope that there would be complementarity between the two spaces so that they are not two independent facilities uh, and you know that there is an overlap or dovetailing in terms of use times uh, that may not be the peaks at the same period so rather than providing a large park car park that can only be used for one purpose and another car park that can only be used for a separate purpose that there would be complementary use of that to reduce the overall provision requirement and increase the sustainability of the whole project. OK, thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Colin Stewart. Thanks, Provost. And um, just a supplementary to Councillor Waters question before I ask mine. Um, appreciating what you say about the complementarity, but in actual fact, there's a there's a good Sorry, not Councillor Waters' question, Councillor Harvey's, I think. Um, there's a good point there. If the commercial car park were to be charged for, then there would be an incentive for people to use the park and ride and take up all of the spaces um, for that were otherwise intended for commuter traffic. So is it possible to, do, do we know, or is it possible to impose a condition about charging for the, for the, um, hotel, museum, development, car park spaces? Thank you, Councillor Stewart. I think my response to that would be that would be a matter for ongoing operational consideration once the development in place, if there was found to be any conflict. Uh, but as I say, it's anticipated that there would be uh, a joint working arrangement between the, the parties to ensure that it was an appropriate uh, undertaking for all the concerned. OK, thanks. Um, another question on the park and choose then. Um, just in terms of um, the proposed conditions, um, I note that um, we're looking for a Section 75 agreement for the transfer of the land. Can I just check that that's a competent thing to do? Because I note that we can't ask for a Section 75 agreement um, for a contribution towards construction. Yeah, sorry, if I, I, I can't you correct there. So the the fact is that the, within the development plan, there is an allocation for a park and choose facility, and we are seeking to secure that planning allocation uh, and the ability for the council to deliver that project uh, in relation to, I think, what you were um, commenting on secondly, was similar to, to Councillor Braun uh, for a, a further uh, expansion of footways along to the east of the holding, which is sorry, I, I, I may be misunderstood, but yeah, I've maybe just, covered the first point of your question. Maybe you can clarify the second. So just just to be very clear, um, the report says that we cannot um, 
Contributions directly towards the construction of the park and choose cannot be secured via condition. So I want to check that although we cannot secure um, contributions towards the construction, we can secure through condition the transfer of the land. That that, you know, we can get the land, but we just can't get the money to build on it. I want to make sure that 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 we're not imposing a condition which is not competent in light of the condition about not getting contributions towards the construction phase. Thank you for that clarification. I think, and again, maybe further clarification, the, it's not a planning condition, it's the, the legal obligation uh, through section 75. Uh, and yes, you're correct that uh, that would be able to secure the transfer of the land and ownership, uh, but not contributions towards the construction cost of that project, which Perth and Kinross Council have committed to delivering. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is on condition 15. Um, that was the question about noise that I asked uh, the applicant about. Um, what we're looking at is a um, condition uh, for the construction activities um, relating to between the hours of seven in the morning and 11 o'clock in the evening daily, 0720, 300 hours daily. Um, I've never seen um, conditions relating to construction activities, uh, as far as I can recall, that go that late on in the evening. Um, if we, A, is that required? And B, if we give permission for this condition, sorry, if we agree, uh, if we approve permission and this condition is there, can that, <coughs> working window be tightened when a more detailed planning application comes forward after the in principle stage? Thanks for that that, that second question. The condition itself has is, is resulted from consultation with our environmental health colleagues and they feel that that is an appropriate condition. It is a, a relatively common approach in many planning applications where this is a, diff a difficulty uh, or a consideration or a potential problem. Uh, so it, it is quite a common approach. We also have uh, a requirement for a construction environment management plan where we would look in more detail to the specifics that would come forward in relation to subsequent applications in respect of potential noise impact uh, on noise receptors. Yeah, sorry, just to be... I really want to be just clear on this point. If the in principle permission is granted and it says seven in the morning till 11 in the evening, that can subsequently be overwritten by a more detailed um, condition either on the, sorry, uh, subsequently over, be overwritten by a condition on either the more detailed application or in relation to the condition about the construction management plan? In effect, yes, you know, subject to the detail before us, but I'll bring in my colleague, uh, the team leader that's dealt with the application, Sean Panton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Smith. Um, yes, just for clarity on condition 15, that condition is more in relation to the plant equipment noise associated with the construction. So for example, if there's a site cabin on the site um, that's got an air conditioning unit, it must adhere to these um, noise restrictions. So the, uh, the construction hours would be controlled via the Kemp. Um, and that's not to say construction would last until 11 p.m. at night. It just means that any plant equipment that's left on the site overnight, such as air conditioning, would have to meet those requirements at 11. OK, thank you very much. Councillor Cusper. Uh, thank you, Provost. My question relates to the section 75. Um, I'm slightly confused about which bit of ground exactly is covered by the section 75, because looking at the, um, the, the plan in the, the proposed site plan, which is I think it's the expansion um, potential to suit park and ride, is a totally different shape and size from the one that was in the planning permission that's got consent, which seems to be about twice the size of what's showing in this application. If you could clarify that for me. Yes, Councillor Cuthbert, thanks for that question. That The area specified would be agreed in the section 75, subject to discussion between the council uh, and the, the landowner relative to whatever the council and the landowner agreed was the appropriate area. So I wouldn't, 
look at the two areas shown in the two different plans at this point because that may or may not be the areas that are subject. That would have to be agreed between the parties subject to the legal agreement. Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, I don't sit in planning, so there's a, a, a bit of uh, uncertainty about the next steps here. If we, um, this is obviously for planning permit planning permission in principle. If we agree this today, obviously there's a lot of work needs to be done on the final design and layout, etc, etc. Does that final request for planning approval come back to this council or to the planning and placemaking committee? Is that the name there? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, and the expectation is it would go to the planning and placemaking committee. Councillor Lisbard. Thank you. I'm um, just looking for clarification about the number of private cars that are expected to be coming in and out of the site. Um, we've got hotel parking for 240 cars. The park and choose with 100 or more if we can negotiate it up the way to increase the viability of the park and choose. And then I think each of the lodges is expected to have parking for two cars. Is that right? Thank you. I'll defer to my colleague again in, in transport planning to answer that in far more depth than I ever could. Thank you, Christian. Um, if you could just give me two seconds, I'm just going to flick through the report and get the correct information um, for you, Councillor Barrett. Thank you. OK, right, I've got the, the trip attraction information um, in front of me now. Um, so it is intended um, the arrivals um, for the site will be 119 vehicles in the AM peak period. Um, so that is from half past six to half past nine. Um, and then there will be 87 um, departures in the PM um, period from 15. 30 to 18.30, um, there will be 97 arrivals and 155 departures across the whole site. So that includes hotel, museum and lodges. Um, in relation to your question um, regarding the lodges, um, in the AM and in the AM arrivals and departures, um, it will be seven arrivals and seven departures. In terms of the PM for the lodges, um, there will be 14 arrivals and 11 departures. Thank you, Councillor Rebeck. Thanks, Provost. Uh, it's a, another question with apologies. Um, sorry, the, sorry, um, Councillor Rebeck, I'll just stop you Provost. there. Can I um, let Councillor Peter Barrett come with a point of clarification, which I'm assuming is on the previous point? Hey, so, sorry, Provost, it's maybe a subsequent question to Councillor Barrett, Barrett's question, so I'm happy to allow Councillor Rebeck to continue. OK, thank you, Councillor Rebeck. Thanks, Provost. Thanks, Councillor Peter Barrett. Uh, like I say, with apology, it's another question about the path, um, a potential footpath anyway, going from east to west, right across the the village. Um, I know that uh, Mr Smith already said it's not competent. It, it does feel to me like it's a reasonable thing for the people of the village to have, given the scale of the development. So. I, it's maybe a bit of an unfair question. We've had a little bit dubiety about whether a path is likely to happen right the way across the village. So I'm just wondering if there's any comment as to how likely that would be to happen, whether it's the developer or the council or a mixture of both. Thank you. Mrs Renton is going to uh, provide an answer on this. During the course of the meeting that I've been engaging with, um, you know, sort of our road safety team, um, we're very, very clear that the council takes its responsibilities for road so safety incredibly seriously. We have an agreed process in terms of how we assess safety conditions on footways and on roads, and that was agreed through um, the then E and I committee. What the team are saying is that they continue to monitor all of the list, and it's an incredibly long list, as you know, sort of as we were made aware at the predetermination committee. Uh, the, we will look again, as you know, Christian has already said, at that at the road and at the footpath 
to make sure that any of the development will not have an impact on in increasing, you know, sort of the difficulties for pedestrians on that. That would this is the, the process that we always take. Um, it has been looked at on, on a number of occasions over a number of years, and the you know sort of and they have taken into account what the development will actually do in terms of um, increased safety or, or or decreased safety for pedestrians. So you have you know sort of the guarantee from myself and the team that we will look at this again and in conjunction with the developer. Thanks for that. that I appreciate that answer. Thank you. It does feel as a little bit of quid pro quo here. That's all, but I appreciate that answer. Thanks, Thank Provost. You. Thank you. Councillor Peter Barrett. And thanks, Provost. Yeah, I, I, I understood uh, from reading the background gom the, the documents that there was a, an attempt by the Council to apply a condition that there'd be two parking spaces per lodge in the lodge part of the development, but that the applicant had come back querying um, whether if they did that, then it would be against the licensing conditions for the for, for the park. So um, I, I thought that Councillor Barrett's question was regarding how many parking spaces there would be in total and how many would be in the lodge park, but I could be wrong. Mr Smith. Yeah, th thank you, Councillor Peter Barrett. I believe that there is a condition that sets out how many spaces would be required in relation to the lodges and I, I believe that that is two spaces. So the plan, the planning recommendation is that there would be two spaces per lodge. OK, thank you very much. Um, I have no further indications of members wishing to speak. Um, thank you, Mr Smith and other officers for your contributions and answers today. Um, I am now uh, looking to see if there is a motion. Um, I have Councillor Grant laying with a motion and Mr Leader, you can you come in? Thank you very much, uh, Provost. And I'd like to thank all the officers for answering diligently our questions and also to both the deputations who um, certainly uh, brought different things to the table. Um, like any planning application, uh, everything comes down to balance. And um, after hearing the, the assurances from Mrs Renton that we will work with the developer and uh, uh, look again at the path and the safety uh, for the residents of West Confons and uh, Confons Holdings, I would um, I am minded to support the, this application. Um, I think it sends a message to business that the council is open for business and we're looking to grow Perth City Centre and Perth City through the economy, through inward investment. Um, um, I was more concerned that this would be a satellite development outside Perth, but um, uh, with the, the linkways in towards uh, Perth, I think it will be uh, complementary. I'd like to at this time say that the administration, hopefully working with members across the chamber, we will look at our capital budget to bring forward the park and choose uh, facet uh, uh, to our capital budget to be assessed uh, in, the, in the proper way. Um, I think it would make sense to, to develop the park and choose area at the same time as the development uh, is taking place, this proposed development. Um, um, I, I understand it will be difficult for all members and it will be down to individual opinions, but I'm happy to move the paper as it stands. Thank you, uh, Mr Leader. Um, I understand the Deputy Provost wishes to second. Thank you, Provost. The report before us today gives us the opportunity to approve in principle a major development that, if approved, could bring considerable benefit to Perth, Perth and Kinross and the wider Tayside region. It is before us today because the present LVP identifies the land in question for employment use, but the intended use is for leisure and retail. I am content with that change. The, inten the intended use will provide employment and the retail component will be limited to that which supports the planned developments. Vitally for me, we are not changing the use of a greenfield site outside the settlement boundary. The Vehicle Museum will include what I understand is a very high class collection that has no equal regionally or even perhaps nationally and will draw people to Perth and Kinross. 
The intended four-star hotel will be an important boost to an, our accommodation offer in and around Perth that will help attract visitors. The holiday chalets will offer a different style of accommodation that will also help to attract more visitors to our region. Together, these three components will provide considerable additional employment opportunities and will generate considerable additional spending in Perth and Kinross. But vitally, our approval of this planning permission in principle will require the transfer of land to be developed as a park and choose site. This requirement is a fundamental component of my support for this application. The park and choose site has long been in the LDP and we must seize the opportunity of this requirement in the planning permission in principle to develop the park and choose site. This park and choose site is a vital component of a more sustainable vision we have for transport in and around Perth. And again, I am reassured by what has been said about looking again at better provisions for road safety in the rest of West Kinforns. I am persuaded of the arguments made in the paper. I urge members to support and approve this application for planning permission in principle. Opportunities such as this come but rarely. Where they have merit and where they help us pursue the Council's objectives, we must support them. Thank you. Thank you. I have Bailey Bailey with an amendment. Thank you, Provost. Although this development takes its official access from the A90 interest interchange, it is, as Mr Windsor said, human nature that some people will take the perceived shortcut and drive through the holdings to reach this development. Therefore, there will be an uplift in traffic on Kinforns Holdings. <coughs> Kinforns Holdings is a road where I know that police have reported drivers to the procurator for driving at 50 and 40 miles an hour in the 20 mile an hour zone. This isn't your standard rat run and approval of this application will increase the traffic using it. It increases by 23% over baseline according to the developer's own submission that we have before us today. The developer's traffic model also suggests that the average speed on the road will be 30 miles an hour, which is concerning given that it's a 20 mile an hour limit. So the developer themselves are telling us that they think that there will be, people will be exceeding the speed limit by 50%. Therefore, I wish to move that we approve this application with the recommendation 33 amended to require a dedicated pavement to be constructed for the full length of Kinforns Holdings. The existing virtual pavement is wholly within the public road and therefore making it tangible, so to speak, should not require any land out with the PKC boundary, therefore is within our gift to decide. Thank you. Thank you, Billy Billy. Do you have a second? Or? Well, I'm just asking the, asking the chamber if there is a second. Or. <laughs> Hold on, hold on, I'll come. To, let's establish the second or first. Okay. I'm going to take a five minute recess to uh, allow this to be discussed um, with legal officers. I'm sorry, Provost, what are you allowing to be discussed? We didn't hear. Sorry, a five minute recess so that Bailey Bailey can discuss with officers the competency of his amendment. Right.
Okay, thank you, members. Um, I have, after considering the legal advice and the advice of our uh, officers um, and consideration of uh, the legal position, decided to rule that the amendment is incompetent. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Provost. I respect that position. I'd ask that we instead um, formally minute that further discussions will take place between the Roads Authority and the developer police to see if anything can be arranged as further detailed planning permission applications come forward. Thank you. Okay, that can be included in a minute. Um, Councillor Colin Stewart has a point of clarification. Um, thank you, Provost. In relation to your ruling on the competence of uh, Bailey Bailey's um, proposed amendment, can I check that your consideration of the um, arguments referred to um, policy 60B of the local development plan, in particular paragraph, uh, first paragraph B, which says that all development proposals should incorporate appropriate mitigation on site and or off site provided through developer contributions where appropriate, which might include improvements and enhancements to the walking network and public transport and safety uh, sorry, public transport services, including railway and level crossings, road improvements and new roads. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. I did consider that and um, as part of my ruling, considered the fact that the Roads Authority has determined that there is no uh, issue there as part of their assessment and therefore it is not a reasonable thing to apply if the Roads Authority has determined um, that the issue is not significant of merit of a condition in that respect. OK, thank you, Provost. Are there any other amendments? Are there any comments from members? And I have a point of clarification from Councillor Waters. Thank you, thank you, uh, Provost. Um, you know, I have, I, have a, I have a lot of concerns about about this, and and uh, Bailey Bailey has has uh, voiced voiced one of them, and is quite happy to wait on you know go on the commitment that officers officers uh, are going to have a look at the road situation and and find a solution for that. Uh, I also have uh, a lot of real concerns over the the active travel travel route and 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 while. Um, I, I, I take officers response that as, as part of uh, our active travel route um, and with SUSTRANS funding we may get an, a, a level a level of um, uh, a contribution there to get that upgraded to, to a suitable a suitable uh, standard that would that would uh, be part of uh, would be complementary or, 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 in my view, needed for a site of this type. Um, and, and we also have the park and choose situation. We have, we do have a lot of ifs and buts in here, you know, and, and, and there's nothing, there's nothing firm in there. And it would be no, you know, from a, 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 the LDP perspective uh, coming out with, you know, whether policy one, four or policy, for policy seven, you know, you know, there's a lot of concern that that you know some of the stuff that we we are getting to 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 allow this to go through. And while I, I, I you know, I I like the idea of what it is. It's just the infrastructure outside the red boundary is not in place um, in the slightest. And I understand that there's there's been an, an agreement with, 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 with Bailey Bailey to try and have a look at that, but it all needs to be taken as a whole to ensure that this is that this this these ifs and buts are are deliverable. Um, and and I'm not quite comfortable with that yet. And I'm just wondering if if someone, an officer or somebody, can give some clarification that that we are absolutely able, we or we will put the resources in. To ensure that that these elements are are addressed and delivered to complement the to 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 allow that act of travel to allow the park and choose to 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 allow the the, the residents amenity over that road, which this does this application doesn't protect their amenity. It doesn't protect. Uh, uh, I think it's 
uh, policy 1B or something from the transport perspective. It doesn't make it safer for them. And, and, and there needs to be some real commitment that we are we are going to do that. And, and that's where I have a real, real concern just now. Thank you. OK, um, Councillor Waters, so um, a lot of what you said was a comment, although I did think there was also a point of clarification in there in respect of you were seeking an answer from officers. We would not normally um, take questions um, from officers, but you have phrased it as a point of clarification. Um, do you want to, because there was a lot there, do you want to be concise about the exact yeah, I, I, point I, I, of clarification? I want, I can, I can, uh, Bailey, Bailey has got the, 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 the kind of a commitment, I think, to look at to look at the, the, the road section from the from the amenity of the residents uh, without a doubt. I think the 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 park and the park can choose that this this there there is a benefit uh, to the, the 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 wider area and 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 there is a commitment to get that in place to allow alternative forms of transport and 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 also and also from the active travel perspective that there's good walking and cycling adequate you know and good walking uh, and and active uh, cycling routes from the site into into Perth. Okay. Um, I'm I'm going to allow the executive director to um, provide some clarity in response to that. Thank you, Provost. Councillor Waters, um, we've already, you know, sort of, and is now formally minuted, you know, sort of the commitment that the council is taking in terms of the footway to work with the developer um, uh, to see what we can do. Um, in terms of my understanding of uh, Councillor Lane's motion, then it was very clear about bringing forward, you know, sort of and working across the council and with officers in terms of the other elements, particularly in terms of the park and choose. Um, and if, you know, sort of if the leader is, is um, willing, then that would then also look at the other elements of the act of travel. OK, I'm going to allow the Head of Legal Governance to provide um, a short clarification around the legal position as well. Thank you, Provost. It was just actually to make some clarification in terms of what our powers are here and what we are doing. We are sitting here determining a planning application and it's been outlined the reason why the amendment was, was not competent, because it's not something that could competently be dealt with under in terms of a planning condition. The more detailed issues that uh, Councillor Waters was raising around active travel, we have already heard on numerous occasions from officers that the detail around things like that will be teased out in the full planning application process. So this is areas that would be within the gift of the Council. In terms of wider road safety issues, regardless of positions that and conditions that apply during planning, does not in any way erode or negate our duties as a roads authority. And we've heard from Executive Director Renton that in terms of her obligations as a roads authority, she will be looking again and fully assessing the, the situation as regards the footpath. So the, the issue around here is that we are limited in what we can do in terms of planning law, because you're sitting here as a planning authority determining a planning application. That's quite distinct from matters which you've had an assurance from Executive Director Renton and indeed has been minuted to, in terms of our looking at our responsibilities as a roads authority as regards the footpath. So I just wanted to make that bit clear and that is the reason why the amendment was um, ruled incompetent. Uh, Councillor Peter Barrett. Um, thanks, Provost. Um, I wanted to um, comment in favour of the, the, the motion. I just want to double check that there are no motions to defer or, or, or refuse, which should probably come before me. No, Councillor Barrett, no one has indicated any amendments for anything else. So it is okay. just the motion as Councillor Ling outlined. Thank you um, very much, um, Provost. As I said, I want to speak in um, support of this application. I think, as has been said previously, it does come down to uh, difficult and fine judgments over the economic benefits of the proposals outweighing departures from the uh, local development plan policies. 
um, but it also involves our capacity uh, and our appetite for growth and questions our openness uh, to, 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 to business. Uh, particularly when we have a proposal which delivers um, on long held aspirations. Um, as a council, we've long discussed how to capitalise on the underdeveloped opportunities uh, that the Tay River presents as an asset to support Perth uh, as a tourist destination with enhanced uh, visitor attractions. Um, this application comprising um, a four star hotel, and it does seem that, that they're a bit like number one buses in that you don't see one for decades and then suddenly three come along at once. Um, uh, a luxury lodge park, although I'm not convinced that there is actually the capacity to accommodate uh, 50 or so lodges in that, but that will be assessed properly uh, at the detailed uh, uh, planning, planning stage. Um, I think uh, attractions including um, a specialist museum as an additional uh, uh, Perth attraction building on and complementing our existing cultural uh, offer uh, and the forthcoming uh, City Hall Stone of Destiny uh, centrepiece will make Perth a more attractive uh, for visitors to stay, uh, stay for uh, longer periods of time and not just pass through. I believe that the restrictions on retail use and space uh, protect the city centre from migration of spend uh, to edge of town development. Um, I think the proposal offer the, the means to translate all the talk and aspiration to date into a route to delivery um, of a £33 million development and investment in our uh, uh, city, um, 100 full-time equivalent local jobs on site uh, and the generation of £4.3 million worth of visitor spend in Perth and Kinross uh, and that we should approve this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Councillor Robertson. Uh, thank you, Provost. I've, I've listened carefully to the debate and everything that everyone has said. And personally, I, I don't have a problem with this development, but um, I have to say that I have got strong sympathy for some of the comments, especially the ones that have come from uh, Bailey Bailey uh, with regard to, to this. Um, development, as someone who comes from Kenrosia, who's seen a rapid growth of, of housing developments, I'm now seeing that that's coming about, but not with the the desired infrastructure improvements to, to, to sustain good quality of life for all our residents. And I think we as a council should start to send out a signal in developments like this. This is outline planning consent, but when, the, when this comes forward for full consent, I think we should insist that all the necessary infrastructure requirements are in place. I'm thinking particularly of what the the residents said in their in their presentation at the pre um, application discussion and also the, the comments were made by uh, Councillor Bailey Bailey. Um, we can't just and, and we're running into dangers in parts of Perth as well. We're allowing huge areas of development and not putting any infrastructure in to cope with it, which is creating real difficulties in certain arterial roads going to Perth. So I think we should actually develop it all very well, but even in these um, um, difficult times, we must make sure that we are putting in the infrastructure into these to support these developments so that the quality of life of people already living there isn't substantially impacted by them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robertson. Councillor John Duff. Thank you, Provost. Uh, I welcome our decision uh, to progress this application in principle. As we have heard, the overall development will bring significant and much needed economic benefit and growth uh, to Perth and Kinross in its own right, whilst the ability, uh, hopefully in time once we have completed the feasibility study, uh, to develop the Council's proposed um, park and choose site will add positively to the Council's transport infrastructure. Uh, I recognise the concerns of some local residents and in particular those of Dr and Mrs Windsor and I welcome the Council's commitment to work with the developers, the community and our road experts to find the best and safest solution to the road safety concerns. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Councillor Duff. Um, there being no amendment, um, there is therefore no vote. Um, is the Council agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay, thank you. That is the end of that item. Um, if we could uh, ask Councillor Forbes and Bailey Ahern to return, I will uh, wait until they are back.
Okay, members, um, if all members are content, I'm going to propose a 45 minutes lunch break so that we can resume at half past two. Um, there being quite a bit of business still left to get through, and I'm assuming that you all would like to finish before five o'clock tonight. Um, uh, therefore, 45 minutes for lunch. Everyone agreed? Thank you very much. See you at half past two.